All right. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're logging in from. Welcome. It's my pleasure to uh, greet everyone as you come in and to introduce our guest today, talking about um, rich reports and in particular uh, funding uh, research in religious studies and in consciousness research. Thanks to some generous support from uh, the John Templeton Foundation and the, Temp and the Templeton World Charities Foundation. Joining us today is Mikhail Van Elk, uh, professor, Associate Professor at Leiden University. He'll be talking about the Open Science of Religion Initiative. Lara Engelbert, uh, PhD candidate at BU Amsterdam, who's uh, giving some firsthand experience with what it uh, took to submit a, a, a registered report and get it published. Olivia Lowry, Senior Project Coordinator here at the Center for Open Science, talking about the funding mechanism with consciousness research. And yours truly, uh, David Meller. I'm the Director of Policy here at the Center for Open Science, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone today. Today we'll be going over um, an overview of what pre-registration is and how registered reports facilitate that process. Then we'll be going into Lara's personal experience with publishing in the format. Olivia will talk about uh, attaching a funding mechanism to the process. Um, and finally, we'll be talking about the Open Science of Religion Initiative and the journals uh, associated with that, uh, with that initiative. And we'll have plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So please use the chat feature as we are going about if there are clarifying questions or you, you need something um, uh, you know, clarified right then, we'll be monitoring, monitoring that and we'll politely interrupt if there's something a little bit unclear. Uh, most of the questions will be used in the Q&A feature, please, and, and we'll uh, get most of those towards the end. But again, don't hesitate to put those in and we'll make sure to either answer them live during the webinar or if we do unfortunately run out of time, we'll copy those down and send them out in written form um, afterwards. So I wanted to give a brief overview, a little bit of a definition of uh, some of the mechanisms associated with registered reports. I'll be starting that off. I'd like to define what precisely a pre-registration is and then how that relates to the re registered report publishing format. A pre-registration is a timestamped research plan created before the study. And its main purpose is to make a clear distinction between the planned hypothesis uh, testing research, the confirmatory tests, and any unplanned serendipitous findings. Um, and it's to, the purpose is to make the distinction between those two modes of research a little bit more clear. These two modes of research, research complement each other very well, uh, but they're quite different. So when we're in the context of confirmation, this is traditional hypothesis testing that um, a lot of the, the formal statistics that we're trained in are relevant for. And the goal here is to minimize false positives. We don't want to assert that there is some sort of effect or trend unless we're relatively certain of it. The context of the discovery is equally important. We, we don't want to miss something that serendipitous or unexpected. We want to minimize false negatives. Um, but the purpose of this is not to uh, make inferences to wider populations. The purpose of this is to generate hypotheses and the pre-registration process is a way to make the distinction between these two modes a bit more clear. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're quite often faced with the tension um, and the fact that presenting exploratory results as if they had been confirmatory makes them look more uh, publishable and exciting, but it comes at the expense of their credibility. So register reports is a publishing format that takes advantage of uh, this system and um, incentivizes specifically the, the uh, creation and, and publication of purely confirmatory or distinctly separated exploratory research. It's a publishing format in which peer review occurs before results are known, and it pushes peer review into two stages. So the first stage of peer review takes place right as the study design process is occurring. And that stage of the peer review process Authors submit the introduction, proposed methods. If there's any pilot data to demonstrate feasibility, that's appropriate for the first submission of a registered report. 
and the editorial and reviewer evaluation at that point uh, asks if the hypotheses are well-founded, are the methods proposed um, feasible, um, and importantly, are there quality control checks to make sure that the study will provide an appropriate test? If those are yes um, to all those questions, the, the proposed study can be offered in principle acceptance, a promise to publish regardless of outcome. The final stage of peer review occurs, of course, after the study is conducted. And those include uh, um, virtually unchanged methods or, and the introduction that was already submitted. The results from the confirmatory um, hypothesis tests and any serendipitous findings are encouraged at that point, uh, as long as they're clearly labeled as such. And of course, the interpretation and discussion. The evaluation at that point is asking whether or not the positive controls succeeded if, if any quality control tests were required ahead of time. Are the conclusions justified by the data? But very importantly, whether or not the main hypotheses were supported or significant or, or, or novel, those are specifically excluded from that second uh, stage of peer review evaluation. We know of about uh, over 300 journals that offer the register report format across many, many different disciplines. Today, of course, we're talking about uh, conducting register reports in consciousness and religious studies. And there's a, a comprehensive set of materials, both for authors, for reviewers, and for editors uh, at, on the website, cos.io slash RR. So with that, it is my happy pleasure to pass the baton to uh, Lara Angerbud to talk about her personal experience with publishing in the format. So I will stop sharing my screen and Laura will start hers. Yes. Okay, um, can, you, can you hear me well? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, okay, perfect. All right, then I share my slides. Um, yeah, I hope you can see them. Okay, so uh, oh. yeah, yeah, can Look, you see? Them? Looks good. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, hello everyone. My name is Lara. Um, I'm a PhD student in organizational cognitive neuroscience at the VU in Amsterdam. And I'm very excited um, to be here today and tell you a bit about my open science journey. A journey that has pretty much be, um, yeah, pretty much started with the uh, salmon. Um, so in my PhD project, um, I work on information processing mechanisms and charismatic leadership. I look at how people process information from charismatic leaders and what the outcomes of people's processing paths are. So I'm working in the field of organizational psychology in which charismatic leadership has a long research history and combine this with cognitive neuroscience methods. So in my studies, I apply cognitive tasks such as memory or error detection tests eye tracking to examine attentional mechanisms, or EEG to investigate the underlying neurophysiological responses to messages from charismatic leaders. So in all of my projects, I aim to shed light on how charismatic leaders affect followers' cognitive information processes. And for one of my projects, I chose the registered report format. So why registered reports? This fish here plays a crucial role in my motivation to start writing a registered report. How did the fish motivate me to choose this format? Well, during my research master, I was very invested in learning about neuroimaging. I wanted to learn how to design and conduct functional MRI studies, how to analyze brain activation and draw meaningful conclusions from this data. At some point, one of my teachers introduced us to a paper by Craig Bennett and his colleagues. The researchers let a dead salmon view a series of photographs showing humans in different social situations. And they asked the salmon to indicate what emotions the people in these photos were experiencing, all while scanning the fish. The researchers found significant brain activation in the brain of the fish. So was the salmon engaged in the task? I think we all know the answer to that. Yet, why did Bennett and his colleagues find brain activation in a dead fish? The researchers' aim was by no means to devalue functional neuroimaging. 
They rather aimed at illustrating the incredible importance of choosing rigorous analysis techniques. And in this particular case, to uh, point to the importance of correcting for multiple comparisons in neuroimaging data. They wanted to point out the relevance of choosing appropriate methods and of reporting results in a transparent way, because otherwise you might end up with suspicious findings. And this is not a problem that is unique to the field of neuroimaging. These issues apply to any scientific field, publication bias, the replication crisis, and methodological pitfalls in cognitive neuroscience have really shaped my thinking ever since. And open science, especially the registered report format, are one of the most effective tools to solve these problems in my view. My supervisors, and one of them being Michiel van Elk, who is here with us today, are strong advocates of open science and have always supported my efforts to conduct open, transparent research. They also introduced me to the concept of registered reports. And soon after I started my PhD, we agreed on choosing this path for my first project. So to me, registered reports really have been the scientific holy grail, a way of conducting research that prioritizes transparency, reproducibility, thoughtfulness, and also eliminates publication bias towards only publishing positive results. The submission process of our registered report required a lot of back and forth communication, a lot of emails, a lot of meetings, a lot of revisions before even submitting. We had to think about everything, every potential obstacle that we could encounter along the way, we had to think about it beforehand and made sure that we would take it into account when writing our stage one report. So after a long wait, we finally submitted our first manuscript, the stage one manuscript, containing our hypotheses, a theoretical foundation, and our proposed methods. So I have two major associations with the outcome of that submission process, constructive and time consuming. In total, it took us more than two years to get from stage one, so submitting the introduction and method, which went under review before we collected data, to stage two, in which we submitted our full paper containing the data. Two major revision rounds, adjustments due to the pandemic, lengthy review stages, but also very constructive and helpful reviewers accompanied us. Once we got to stage two, after two revisions, we finally collected the data and wrote the full manuscript. And the whole process became a bit less stressful to me. And I think this is mainly because I was so relieved of finally submitting the whole paper containing much of the work of my uh, last years. Our hypotheses were only partially supported and some results were inconclusive. Of course, this was somewhat disappointing. And I was wondering whether I made any mistakes in designing or conducting the studies. But soon I realized that no fundings matter. They are part of the leader follower phenomenon we investigated as much as our supported positive findings are. They also offer us opportunities to develop our research further and take new perspectives. Throughout the process, the communication with the editor and reviewers of our paper has been very clear, helpful and straightforward. And at the moment we are actually waiting for the final method review, so fingers crossed. But for me, it's really a twofold process. It has been an incredibly constructive and progressing, but also time consuming path. And time is not exactly what you have a lot as a PhD student. So would I do it again? Honestly, I'm not sure. As I find myself staring at the status of my registered report on the journal submission platform, I often ask myself that question. From a scientific perspective, our project without any doubt has incredibly improved by choosing this path. And I learned a lot about conducting open science. I'm also still convinced that registered reports play a crucial role in moving science forward. There are effective tools to battle underpowered or poor design and method choices as illustrated by the Salman experiment. They prevent the bias of publishing only positive results and increase transparency and reproducibility. Yet, I cannot easily say that I would do it again as a PhD student. The length review process and the time it takes is a big minus point. 
But I'm 100% sure that I will do it again once someday I obtain my PhD. And time, at least I hope so, will be a less pressuring factor. I think it's also important to note that the length of the review process is probably very dependent on the journal and field you're working in. And probably a pandemic isn't helping either. One thing is for sure. My urge to conduct open science has ever been growing from learning about the salmon in the scanner to getting familiar with registered reports and gaining my very own experience in writing one. So what's your motivation to consider the registered report format? If you value a transparent way of working and want to contribute to reducing publication bias, I think it's one of the best paths to choose. So thanks a lot for listening to my experience. <laughs> and I will stop sharing. Thank you so much for that, Laura. Olivia, we could um, pass the stage to you. Absolutely, let me share my screen. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, Laura, for sharing your experience with registered reports. Um, if you're interested in conducting a registered report, a really important question is, can you get the registered report funded? And what are some funding mechanisms for doing this? Um, luckily for consciousness researchers and religion researchers, we have a couple of initiatives that are specifically designed for supporting researchers who are interested in using the registered reports format. I'm going to be discussing the Consciousness Research Initiative, which is sponsored by the Templeton World Charity Foundation, administered at the Center for Open Science, and supported by our friends at the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. So the process begins with a pre-submission form, which you can find on our website, submitted um, directly to Center for Open Science. The form will ask you for a variety of information, including the title of your project, timeline for its completion, which journal you would like to submit uh, your article to, and a structured abstract, which will include the background, objective, and methods of the study. It will also ask you to upload a separate file, which will contain the budget for the proposal. Um, this form goes directly to the team at COS, where we evaluate the budget, and if necessary, send the abstract to a review panel made up of consciousness experts to determine subject matter appropriateness. If approved to continue, you can then submit your stage one article for peer review at participating journals follow the registered reports process and receive partial funding after in-principle acceptance. Full funding is administered at the end of the process once the article has been approved following stage two peer review and all materials are shared to the maximum extent possible. Um, we will be administering 30 to 75 awards through this initiative in the range of 15 to 20,000 US dollars with some awards uh, in the $50,000 range if exceptional proposals are submitted that require greater funding. Uh, we encourage the budget to be heavier on participant support and research materials as opposed to other um, forms. You can find a copy of the budget template linked in the application form and on our website. Um, we have a number of participating journals, including Neuroscience of Consciousness, Calabra, Royal Society, Open Science, Advances in Cognitive Psychology, and a range of peer community and registered reports journals, um, which you can see here, and they're also listed on our website. But if there is another journal that offers registered reports that you would like to submit to, one that you don't see on this list, you can go ahead and shoot us an inquiry email and we can see if submission to that journal would be possible for this initiative. So just to cover a few questions we get asked a lot, who is eligible to apply? Um, to be eligible for this grant, an applicant must use the award fund to fund an empirical study um, researching consciousness, reside in an eligible country. Um, awards can't be sent to countries where US law prevents such um, transactions, but you can find that list on our website as well. Um, uh, you have to engage in open science practices to the greatest extent possible, including pre-registration, study materials and analytical code sharing, data sharing, and posting of preprints, and conduct the study and prepare to submit the paper for publication by the end of 2024. When are grant applications due? Um, well, this is a great question. Grant applications are accepted on a rolling basis. So grant applications um, uh, started being accepted in April of 2022 and will be closed either when funds have been exhausted or summer of 2023. So due to the rolling nature of the application acceptance, submitting an application as early as possible will maximize your chances of being funded. And finally, can you apply for the grant multiple times? Um, a researcher or group of researchers can apply for funds multiple times if the funds will be used in distinct studies. 
That is a single researcher or group of researchers can apply for funding multiple times, but a study can only receive funding once. Um, there's quite a bit more information on this initiative, which you can find on our website, including a range of frequently asked questions. So if you have any questions about the initiative, please check out our website. And if you still have questions following this, feel free to reach out to me. My contact details can also be found on the website. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to seeing your applications and uh, I will turn it over to you, Michael. Okay, thanks. Good day, everyone. Let me share my screen as well. Right. So in this age of open science, replication, registered reports, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that concerns about replicability date back already to decades ago. So to get started, I will tell you something today about the Open Science of Religion project. And many of you might know this classic study that is a textbook study in many psychology textbooks. From Jerusalem to Jericho, a study of situational and dispositional variables in helping behavior by Darley and Betson. They asked theology students to, to prepare a speech, a speech about the Good Samaritan or a speech about the job prospects on the market. And then they had to cross the road to another side of the university. And on the road, they came across a victim. And there were multiple conditions. People were either stressed to hurry up or they were emphasized that they would have sufficient time. And then the question was, if theology students had prepared a speech about a Good Samaritan, would they be more willing to help the victim compared to when they prepared a speech about something else? The conclusion about the original paper was, it did not have an effect at all. Religious priming did not make people more likely to help the victim. The only effect that was significant was an effect of the time pressure manipulation. Only if people were not rushed, they were more likely to help the victim. However, this conclusion, as it has ended up in a textbook, was contested already at the time. In a comment by Anthony Greenwald, he argues, does the Good Samaritan parable, in, parable increase helping? A comment on Darley and Betson. He actually contests this conclusion. He says, if you closely look at the data, and if you do a Bayesian reanalysis of the data, it is actually not that clear if there was no effect of religious priming on helping behavior. He basically concludes, it makes it clear that more data must be collected to allow reason reasonably firm conclusions about the effects of these treatments. There is a trend, but the study, the original study was underpowered to detect an effect. And in that case, he is already calling for replication with a more high powered study. So I think that is clearly illustrating the relevance of registered reports. If you want to show there's an effect, you need to do a high powered replication study. And then we move three decades later. When I was doing research myself on, reli on religious priming, I used religious primes like devil, angel, demon, God, etc., to see if it would make people more pro-social. And I could not find effects. At the same time, this meta-analysis came out, actually arguing that there was very strong evidence for religious priming on a wide variety of different dependent measures, including pro-social behavior. So I was puzzled, how can this be that I cannot replicate these findings, but in the meta-analysis, there appears very convincing evidence. So what we did at the time is we did a reanalysis of the data that was part of this meta-analysis. And what we showed is that depending on which meta-analytic uh, analytic technique you choose, you can either get very strong evidence for religious priming, or you can either get evidence for complete absence of religious priming. It really depends on the cho choices you make in your meta-analysis. And in that way, we call for the importance of registered replications. The only way forward to establish if there is an effect or if there's not an effect is to do a registered report study or a registered replication. So over the past years, I've uh, gained some experience with conducting multiple registered report studies, including a variety of different topics uh, and a variety of different journals, more cognitive journals, more social psychology journals. Um, and it has been an interesting learning process, as Lara already illustrated. Actually, in many cases, we obtained null results. So the hypotheses were not confirmed, which can happen and which is also valuable, but at the same time, a bit disappointing because of course you hope to have made a new scientific discovery. However, on the more positive side, in the case of a well-established paradigm, we were well able to replicate and basically extend previous results. 
And in the case of Lara, we actually got mixed results and also some exploratory results that provided input for new analysis. So my experience with registered reports, there are clear advantages that have already been listed by David as well. You benefit from peer review and expert input at an early stage. You get in, pr in principle acceptance. And this can also be a benefit for early career researchers who care about uh, having a publication, a guaranteed publication. You can still do uh, exploratory research, but as David nicely illustrated, you can clearly demarcate between confirmatory and exploratory analysis. However, be prepared for null results. In many cases, it turns out that reality is more complicated than you expected it to be. And of course, you can reduce experimental and publication bias. Some perceived disadvantages, it is time consuming. It might take a lot of time. I have positive experiences that it uh, only took a couple of months. But in Lara's case, it took more than two years. But at the same time, and this is especially important to communicate to more senior researchers, there's a shift of the workload. So normally PhD students spend the final year of the project mostly on writing papers and writing their thesis. But in this case, that workload is shifted to the early stage of the process. And people uh, actually benefit from this later on because they already have written their theoretical introduction on all their method section for all the studies. And another disadvantage is feasibility, specifically for high powered studies. And this is where Another funding scheme comes in uh, that I would like to highlight today, which is the Open Science of Religion project. Also funded by Templeton, but in this case, the John Templeton Foundation, the Open Science of Religion project offers funding for conducting registered report studies in the field of the psychology of religion and spirituality. And we are bound uh, by, uh, to, to, for publications that are submitted to these three scientific journals, the Archive for the Psychology of Religion, the International Journal for the Psychology of Religion and Psychology of Religion and Spirituality. So the funding scheme is really only if you intend to submit to one of these journals and there are no ex there's no exception possible uh, in this case. And this is also a joint initiative from the editors of all three respective journals. So this is the editorial team who is in charge of uh, running the Open Science of Religion project. There's Ward Davis from Wheaton College who's also joining this webinar. Jordan Labouf from Un University of Maine was also present with us. Kevin Lett from Indiana U University of South Bend, and then there's me. And together we handle all incoming submissions on a rolling basis. By the way, if you're interested to find out more information, here's the link to the project and the slides are also available on the Open Science Framework if you want to look them up later on. So the call for proposals runs from 2022 to 2024, and in total there will be funding available for conducting 18 registered report studies on a general topic related to the psychology of religion and spirituality. The awards are uh, 20,000 US dollars uh, and can be spent in any way you like, on conferences, on uh, paying participants, on uh, hiring a research assistant or a, on, on a teaching buyout. The requirements can be found on the website, but basically the core of the uh, application is stage one manuscript, including the introduction and the method section of your proposal, including a detailed analysis plan. And on top of that, a cover letter, a timeline, a budget estimate, and a statement of institutional support. But really the core is the manuscript itself. The process runs as follows. So first off, you submit the documents to the OSR website. Then we do an initial review for eligibility. Then if the proposal is uh, deemed of sufficient fit with the call for this project, then you can submit via the journal website and you're, you're, uh, you're given a suggestion to submit to either of these three journals. Then officially it's sent out for peer review. Uh, once you've received the in-principle acceptance states, then funding will be made available. You can complete the project, write the manuscript, submit again, and then uh, all publications result, resulting from this call will be published called Open Access. The evalu evaluation criteria for the initial stage of the manuscript are importance of the research questions, logic, rationale, and plausibility of the hypothesis, soundness of timeline, methods, power, budget, and applicant's capacity, a sufficiently detailed methodology, and speci specification of outcome neutral checks. So we will evaluate all these uh, five different criteria and provide feedback in, and also offer you the opportunity to revise your proposal if one of these criteria is uh, yet insufficient. So we also came uh, across a couple of uh, frequently asked questions and ba based on that I've collected a couple of do's and don'ts of study designs of ideas that lend themselves really well for this call 
and for study ideas that might uh, not be that suitable. So I think what is really suited for uh, this funding scheme are experimental designs, experimental research, where you have an experimental manipulation, independent variable and dependent variables, cross-sectional designs, correlational studies, replication proposals, like if you want to replicate the Good Samaritan effect, that would be a very interesting and uh, idea and good fit with this goal. Well-powered studies, obviously, and cross-cultural studies. So say you want to replicate a finding that has been conducted in the US in a cross-cultural context, that could also be a good fit. Less suitable for this call appear to be clinical populations due to time constraints, it's difficult to get access to in many cases. Longitudinal designs, because the project will only run three years and should be finished before the end. Complex statistical or theoretical models, like if you have a very complex uh, structural equation model, that is probably really difficult to do as a registered report study because many of these things are very contingent on the data that you collect. And it is really difficult to hypothesize about all the connections between the variables in your model in advance. And also important to emphasize, this goal is really focused on anything related to religion and spirituality. So anything that is focused on using religion as a secondary mechanism is of less interest for this goal. So if your interest, say, in stereotypes and you apply this to the topic of religion, then it might be less suitable. It should be religion and spirituality should be at the core. If you want to learn more about potential topics and uh, fit with this project, we refer to these textbooks, the Handbook of the Psychology of Religion and Spirituality and the Psychology of Religion. Basically any topic discussed in any of these books would be a good fit for this project. So you can think about uh, topics like religious coping, prayer, religion and terror management, the cognitive science of religion, spiritual struggles, God image, religious development, etc. So religion should be central to the research topic and not be used as a vehicle to study something else like prejudice or health. There's really a clear uh, agenda in that sense for uh, what would be a good fit for this call. If you're uncertain and would like to have a chat with any of us, feel free to reach out to us. The primary contact person is the project leader, Ward Davis, so you can uh, direct any question to him, but we also will have some time available for answering your questions right now. So thanks to the COS for organizing this webinar and. Uh, Looking forward to this discussion. Thank you so much, everyone, for the for the overview of um, of all three of those. That was um, really fantastic. We have a couple of questions that have come in, so we'll start with those. Um, and just to assure everyone, um, my slides will be available for um, for sharing afterwards. And um, Mikael had a, a link to his slides there as well. Uh, one question came in, it, it's for Laura, but I think everyone can chime in too on this. Do you think if reviewers could co-author the paper, would it accelerate the publishing process? Um, uh, Laura, that question is uh, directed to you. Do you wanna take the first stab at that? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. I think it's, it's a very interesting one because I assume the assumption is that if reviewers have an intrinsic motivation, then they would review it, the paper faster. Um, I'm not exactly sure whether, I, th it, it, I think it really depends on the person whether that would accelerate the process or not. Um, I don't think it's actually a good idea to do that because then the reviewers wouldn't be independent of the project. And I think they really should be. However, I think maybe journals could find a midway to uh, acknowledge all the work that reviewers put into providing, in our case, incredibly valuable feedback. Um, so instead of leaving them these anonymous helpers, maybe it would be good to at least, um, uh, yeah, really acknowledge them by name <laughs> once uh, the paper is published, because in our case, they really put in a lot of time and effort and provided a lot of extensive feedback. So maybe a midway would be good. Um, but yeah, I don't think that co-authoring uh, is a good idea per se because the independence is so important, especially with registered report where we try to achieve all these um, things like um, reproducibility, transparency, all these kind of things. And then having really an independent party involved is so important to the whole process. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it might be difficult to uh, have a reviewer listed as author. I think that would uh, uh, qu quickly 
point out some potential conflicts of interest. Um, most of the reviews that um, I'm able to conduct these days, uh, I'm fortunate to be able to sign my name to those and some, um, you know, acknowledgement from the journal is always welcome. Publons is also a really neat platform that sometimes those, uh, those reviews get, get listed or recognition and credit for those. So those are all um, nice little bits of acknowledgement um, that, that journals have done for, for reviewers. It might be good to point out that as part of the Open Science of Religion project, reviewers are also offered a small remuneration for uh, their uh, review they provide. I don't know if that's the same for the consciousness call, but uh, uh, in order to increase the effort they put in and that they really take it seriously, they get a small reward, financial reward. Yeah, unfortunately, that's not part of the um, uh, uh, consciousness study process, but that is, uh, I think, a very welcome contribution to the effort that's put in by reviewers. Another question is here in the chat. I'm just reading out. One question we have gotten a lot from prospective applicants is what the following criteria of peer review means. Would one... Um, would one of us please explain what the outcome neutral tests, positive controls, quality control checks are, and why they're a critical component of registered reports? Um, Mikael, do you want to take the first step at that, or I'd be happy to? Yes, I can uh, try to provide a partial answer. So indeed, uh, it is a bit vaguely defined, I think, or not always clear what, what is meant by this. But basically, uh, what you mean with uh, uh, outcome neutral tests is that you want to have some guarantee that, for instance, your experimental manipulation was successful. So, for instance, in the case of religious priming, you want to make sure that uh, what you were priming was indeed related to uh, religion versus something neutral. So you, have a si you can have a simple manipulation check simply asking participants, what was the story about that you just read? Or uh, what was the video about that you just saw? And there, at least, you expect that people will indicate, well, that story was about a religious figure or that story was about something completely different. And that is a check to, to ensure that your manipulation basically was effective before, before you actually look at your dependent variable of interest. So this is something we did, for instance, in a study on priming control. So we wanted to prime people to feeling control or to have a lack of control uh, and then see if that would increase their belief in controlling God. But first off, we needed to check if indeed people were feeling less in control. So that is, in that case, a positive outcome, or, or not positive, but a neutral out, outcome neutral test to just ensure that what you manipulated was indeed successful. And then in, uh, uh, the other uh, positive controls and quality checks are, I think, mainly related to uh, the checks and balances that you build in uh, in order to ensure that your data is of sufficient quality. So in case of an online study, for instance, you can have some quality checks about how much time did participants spend on the survey. And if you already have an indicator that they only spend 20 seconds, that would be a good reason a priori to ex exclude them. And this is something you should think about in advance, like not afterwards coming up with, hey, actually people were quite fast, but this is these are things that you can think through in advance and that are related to the quality of the data that you, co uh, that you collect, outlier exclusion criteria. Um, what, how do you define these? When do you leave a participant in, et cetera? So those are the two aspects that, uh, that I can think of when it comes to these, uh, uh, this criterion. Yeah, I would encourage you to think about uh, at the end of the study, if you're confronted with null results, how can you demonstrate that the, that the study was conducted in a proper manner? Um, so often when we have null results, um, A, we can be discouraged thinking that we just didn't uh, know what we were doing or you know, a critical reviewer could look at that and say, well, of course it failed. They, they didn't um, conduct the experiment properly. So whether some, some sort of demonstration that the, um, that the methods were properly uh, administered is some way to make sure. And, and of course, thinking of that ahead of time is far more powerful than thinking that post hocs are making up an explanation um, after the fact why the null results could be um, uh, could be meaningful. So uh, think of a, a critical reader reading a study after the results are known. How can you prove to that future unknown person that the that the work was conducted as as it should have been? Um, 
question just came in. What is needed from a journal to be included in the RR list? Um, I'll answer that in a couple of different ways. So just a, a reminder that um, the Open Science of Religion has those three journals and, and those are kind of set by the criteria of the grant. The uh, list that's available on the Register Report website, cos.io slash rr, any journal that conducts peer review before results are known and offers an in principle acceptance, a promise to publish regardless of the main outcomes of the study. Those are the two key criterion for um, publishing a registered report. And so if there are journals that you're aware of that offer those that are not available on the website, then we can make sure that those are listed quickly. For the consciousness studies that um, Olivia was talking about, uh, if there's a journal that e either you want to publish in or that you're familiar with and you think should be included on that list of journals, we can add that just with a quick check to make sure it's okay, um, both for content area appropriateness and double check with the journal as well. Question just came in. I'll read it out from Cameron to Mikhail here. When you say that religion should be central in the submissions uh, to your project, how stringent is that? For example, if an applicant is interested in prejudice against a religious group, for example, Muslims, or even against non-religious groups such as atheists, uh, what would we what would need it to be show that religion um, and not prejudice is the main area of study? Yeah, it's a delicate balance in there. I think there's no definite answer there. Um, it will be judged on a case by case basis. And if it's really clear that uh, it is uh, related, I mean, religion is related to your project proposal, uh, then I think it is of a sufficient fit for this specific call. Uh, but it will be judged on a case by case basis. And um, I mean, if you're interested in intergroup processes, uh, for instance, or just in prejudice as a general phenomenon and only use the example of religion as a tool to gain insight in intergroup processes, that is secondary. But if you really have a nice integration of, say, I want to know how, for instance, worldviews interact with stereotypes and prejudice or intergroup conflict, then I think you can make a stronger case that religion is not only a vehicle for understanding another process, but it's also central, a central ingredient of the process you're interested in. So I think that is, uh, should become clear from the proposal, that it could not be the case that you could also focus on other worldviews or any other intergroup phenomenon like football players versus uh, tennis players or whatever. It should be really clear why it is relevant to study this in a religious context. And this is to do with the, the, the funding agenda, basically by John Templeton. They were very clear up front, like, okay, we are interested in funding this, but it should fit with the general donor intent of, uh, of our funding foundation. And that's one thing that we are double checking too with the consciousness studies. Um, those that are study that are publishable in neuroscience and consciousness, is right in line with the um, you know, area of research that is, is fundable. And when it's going to another journal, that, that is, um, we, we do have a, a, a panel made up of board members from the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness um, to help us verify that as well. I don't see any other questions, either in the Q&A or the chat. If additional questions do come on, please shoot us an email uh, and we would be happy to uh, chat more. And bo both of these initiatives are ongoing for the next, uh, actually double, correct me if I'm wrong, the next several months, Mikhail, is that correct? At least, uh, the, the, the next couple of years. So the, the this call next will run years. until okay. uh, 2024. That's but it will be done on a rolling basis. So at some point, if the funding is, uh, is, is gone, then it will no longer be able to apply. But at, in th at this moment, there's still uh, opportunity to apply. So plenty of time to apply. Free to reach out. There's one more question came in. I was a little bit premature there. Could, I, could we chat a little bit about what predictions regarding what um, religiosity should predict are most in need of extra data? 
Um, that's that's actually an interesting question uh, and difficult to answer straight away. I think uh, recently there have been two or three review papers actually about replication and open science in the psychology of religion and spirituality that actually list uh, a couple of topics and studies that could be uh, a good candidate for rep replication. So I'm happy to look up um, uh, those papers and uh, share them with you. Um, things I think that that, that are really obvious is, uh, are, for instance, um, we recently ran a big religious replication project, and based on that, a couple of other suggestions came up to study, for instance, uh, uh, this idea of uh, promiscuous teleology, this idea that everyone has an intentional or this tendency to attribute intentions to natural phenomena. The work by Deb Kaleman uh, has been very influential in the psychology of religion and could be expanded in a much more broader cross-cultural context as well. Something else, uh, Justin Barrett has conducted research on uh, God concepts, showing that people have a theological God concept, like God is powerful, he knows everything, he's loving, but at the same time, people in daily life endorse a very anthropomorphic God concept. That's also based on only a few pre pre preliminary studies, so that is also a very... I think low-hanging fruit to uh, to replicate and uh, then extend in a cross-cultural context as well to see to what extent those findings hold up. Uh, but as said, I think there are two or three excellent review papers on this topic that I'm uh, I would be happy to share with you. Uh, can we talk about the assessment criteria? Um, is that for register reports in general? We, they, we, I can um, make sure to put a link to that. And Mikhail, did you want to? Um, I think he's uh, Timothy is asking specifically about for, for religion. Uh, the evaluation criteria, uh, importance of the research question, logic, uh, soundness, met methods, and outcome neutral tests. So those were the five criteria. Uh, I think a, a general comment that I could still add is, uh, so based on David's presentation, what we often see that goes wrong in practice when people prepare a submission is that like this, this nice distinction where a registered report really helps you to demarcate exploratory from confirmatory research is really what you should keep in mind. And many of the proposals that we've encountered are actually rather exploratory, like they propose a completely new experimental approach or a new study idea or a new structural equation model that would lend themselves perfectly well for a completely exploratory study. But then it is not clear why this should be done as a registered report, because one asset of the registered report is that you already have some something to build on, that you know already approximately what the relationship is between variable A and variable B. So that is that slide basically that I still see in front of me, like that the registered reports demarcate exploratory from confirmatory research is important to keep in mind. And to what extent your study would fit with a confirmatory approach? Well, then it's a good fit with the registered reports. If it's a completely new out of the box ID, well, maybe it might be better to just do the study as an exploratory study. And once you have a better sense of exactly how the results bear out, then you can do a pre-registration or consider doing it as a registered report. I just put a link into the chat for um, a checklist that Chris Chambers has created. Um, he's the chair of the Registered Reports Committee and has reviewed more registered reports than, than I can um, uh, ever count to. So he knows what makes a good submission and what, what, what doesn't. And, and those um, items on that checklist uh, are um, available on the, uh, Richard Report website, um, and, and those kind of help provide a reminder of some important criteria to include in that stage one submission. Another um, ward provided the criteria there. Thank you. And with that, I think I would like to thank again the panel for your your time and your input and for uh, working on all these initiatives. And sometimes I like to end meetings in a little bit of a cheesy way. We uh, here at the Center for Urban Science, we sometimes shout, go science when it's time to, uh, to log out. So I will um, conclude this uh, webinar with the shout of go science.
and hope everyone has a great day.